Globe. My name is Kurt Munson. I'm the engineering manager at HBM Encode. We're going to talk today about powertrain durability, analysis of powertrain durability using measured test data. The purpose of the webinar today is to learn how Encode Glyphworks software can be used to analyze the durability of powertrain components using measured test data. I have a couple of pictures here. At the bottom of the screen here, one is a transmission. We'll be talking today about powertrain driveline torque carrying components like this and trying to understand the durability of rotating parts and also non-rotating parts like the housing. The red squiggly line you see in the background is a torque signal. We're going to learn how we can use this measured torque data to help understand durability and predict and improve product performance. So here's our basic agenda for the next 35 or 40 minutes. First off, I need to define what do I mean by the durability of powertrain components. If I can't define what the problem is, then obviously the rest of this meeting can be very challenged. Secondly, we need to look at how can a piece of software like Encode Glyphworks be used with measured test data to help us answer questions like, what is the durability of our rotating component? How long until a crack develops? Third, we're going to look at software demonstration of the Encode software to see in a live way how we can analyze these problems. We have a couple slides in PowerPoint to set the scene, but the majority of our time today will be spent actually analyzing data live inside Glyphworks. And then lastly, we'll enter the question and answer session. So use, use the chat or Q&A panels in WebEx to provide any questions to me, and I'll do the best I can to answer them at the end of this presentation. So that's our roadmap, where we're going today. So let's think for a minute about durability of powertrain components. I've got a couple of pictures here of different powertrain things. We have a, an entire powertrain and driveline assembly in the middle of the screen from the engine all the way back to the driven wheels. Up at the top, we have the internals of the engine, pistons, connecting rods, camshafts, crankshafts, and so on. Down at the bottom left, the turbocharger. And in the bottom right, a transmission and the housing that keeps it together. We're going to be talking about specifically the torque carrying components that we see on the screen today. We've had other webinars on understanding, say, the stress, life, durability targets and analyzing fatigue behavior of pistons and, and crankshafts and connecting rods and such, or the thermal impact on fatigue of the turbocharger seen in the lower left corner. We're going to focus today specifically on torque carrying items, drive shafts, half shafts, differentials, gearbox, power takeoff units and so on. So now that we understand what powertrain components we're talking about, let's think for a second about fatigue. In a fatigue sense, failure comes from an accumulation of fatigue cycles, accumulation of stress cycles. So varying stresses over time creates what we call cycles, and if enough of those happen, we can have fatigue failure. We've got five different pictures of some catastrophic fatigue failures on this screen here. In the upper left is an aircraft from the late 80s that went into convertible mode while flying from one island of Hawaii to another. This was because of the pressurization, depressurization cycles of flying at altitude versus landing at the, in the thicker air at sea level. In the upper right corner is a, a, a wind power generation turbine that sees cyclic stresses because of wind load, also because of inertial loading. Every revolution of this or changes of speed of, of these blades cause inertial stresses. In the middle is this thing called the Liberty Ship. For those of you with an engineering historic background, you might have read about these. These were ships that were hastily assembled in the 1940s during World War II. Unfortunately, they were not designed with crack tolerance in mind, and as such, many of these broken half. On the human side of things in the lower, lower right corner is someone's dental implant. Just about everything in our body is subjected to some type of cyclic loading, including our teeth when we chew. Believe it or not, fillings and replacement teeth are designed with fatigue in mind because the cyclic stresses that develop while chewing and other uses can lead to cracking and fatigue failure. So we need to be able to understand what cyclic stresses result in use on any type of component. Now on the powertrain side, we're going to look at a couple different, you could say, modes of fatigue or domains of fatigue. The first one I'm going to call the classic or cyclic fatigue case. Say, for example, the housing that keeps all these gears together. 
it sees stress cycles because of changes of load or changes of displacement or maybe even changes of temperature or changes of torque. So it's, this is the classic sense of what we use, we'll use what we call rain flow cycle counting to count how many cycles and how big were those cycles so we can estimate fatigue life. So this is fatigue cycling where stress cycles come from changes of operating environments, changes of torque, changes of load, changes of vibration characteristics and such. Now the internals though in this particular differential are not influenced by external behavior like that, but by internal things. In this case, it's revolutions that matter. So if you look at gears and, and elements of bearings, gear teeth, for example, all of these fatigue cycling comes from revolutions. A single bearing element in one of these roller bearings here is loaded un and unloaded every time it goes around, every time the shaft rotates. So even under constant speed or constant torque or constant load, the fact that it's rotating produces a specific fatigue cycle for every rotation. Some people call this rotating fatigue or fatigue analysis in the rotations or the revolutions domain. We'll look at both of these use cases today, the classic or rain flow traditional fatigue cyclic sense and also the fatigue in the rotating domain as well. We'll look at both of these today. Now both of these, if we want to understand durability, one of the key things is to understand the material or component behavior under cyclic loading. This comes from what we call a fatigue life curve. Often we call this an SN curve, S for stress and N for cycles. Here we see an SN curve in red that says that over on the left side, the higher the stress, the shorter number of cycles to failure. As the stress decreases, the number of cycles allowed to failure increases, no surprise there. And then we even get to the point where if the stress is not very high, we have this thing that we call an endurance limit or a fatigue limit. Some materials exhibit this, and this is a way of showing that some materials, even though the stress cycles happen repeatedly, if their stress cycle size is not very large, we may never, may never have any fatigue damage accumulation. Now on the right side here is an equation, S equals sigma, N, B, some other stuff like this. This is what we call the Baskin SN curve formulation. There's a researcher in the early 1900s of all times that came up with a formulation, a mathematical relationship, a curve fit really, between the size of the stress cycle and the number of cycles until failure. SA, that's the size of the stress cycle. Some people call this stress amplitude or stress range. And NF is the number of cycles to failure. Sigma F prime is the intercept and B is the slope of this Baskin fatigue curve. So what this says is then that the stress and the number of cycles to failure are related by a power law relationship. This is critically important in any fatigue calculation we do. We have to have an understanding of what is the fatigue behavior under known stress cycling, how long will the part last. This can be done on a material test sense to create the SN curve. It can also be done on components, say for example, a whole axle as built with heat treatments, stress concentrations, assembly pre-stress, and so on built into it. On a component level, sometimes these are called TN curves or torque life curves. We'll look at how we use both of these, the stress life curve and the torque life curve today. So this is introducing the idea of material or component behavior in its resistance to fatigue. The other side of the equation we need to think about is what is the customer doing that unfortunately will promote fatigue? I say unfortunately because all customers use things Doubly unfortunate is that most customers abuse things or can use things in a very creative way that we may not have anticipated. So we need to have measured data to help us understand how a customer actually uses these powertrain components. I've got pictures here showing typical data collected for this type of exercise. Torque in red at the top and the bottom is, is uh, in blue is rotational speed of a shaft. So this might be torque and speed input into a transmission. Maybe Crankshaft torque could be coming out of a differential. We could collect other data at the same time as well. Vehicle data from the CAN bus, for example, like what gear are we in? Or what's the throttle position? Or vehicle speed and other metrics that will help us understand what our part is actually doing. For example, with a differential, we may care about torque and speed, but also torque split. So we can see how much slip do we have if we have a limited slip differential. What's the actual 
action at any given time, how much friction is being passed from one side of the clutch to the other. So we're going to talk about using this measured data today to help us understand fatigue and durability. If we're working with a powertrain component like something with gears or bearings, where we have a once per revolution or an N number of times per revolution fatigue cycle, then we're going to use this torque and speed data to our advantage. We're going to do what's called the torque versus revolutions histogram, or sometimes people call this time at revs and torque, or revs at torque and speed. The general idea is we'll take the measured data. You'll see we'll do this live in Glyphworks in just a minute. We'll take the measured data in red, the torque, and the input shaft speed data in, in blue, and we'll, we'll do this thing that we call the, the torque versus revs histogram. The torque, of course, measured time series data, will tell us the magnitude of the fatigue cycles that we're seeing once per revolution. And the speed will be critical for us because it will help us understand per unit of time how many of these cycles are happening. And of course, speed over time equals revolutions, right? So from these two pieces of information, from torque versus time and speed versus time, we can answer the two critical questions for fatigue. How many cycles happened and how big were they? What's the distribution of fatigue cycles? And that's what we're looking at in this plot here. So we're going to switch out of PowerPoint now. We're going to look at using an actual ENCODE piece of software called Glyphworks, this one in the middle, for processing some measured test data. Now, you may have been involved in some of our other webinars, for example, focusing on the use of design life on the left side here. Design life is the same environment as Glyphworks, but instead of analyzing measured test data, it's analyzing the fatigue performance of finite element models, results from ANSYS or Abacus, or NASTRAN. We're not going to focus on that today. We're going to focus instead on this Glyphworks application because remember, after all, the title of this presentation was Using Measured Test Data. So let's go take a look at a couple different ways we can use ENCODE Glyphworks to help answer some of these powertrain durability challenges. We're going to look at four use cases here. First off, we're going to look at the classic cyclic fatigue problem on a, dirt, uh, a differential housing. So the housing itself, maybe this is a crankcase, maybe a, a differential unit housing, sees stress because of changes of load or torque. It doesn't see the once per revolution cycle like a rotating component like a gear or bearing does. So we're going to start with the classic fatigue sense, looking at fatigue of the differential housing. And then we'll move on to look at rotating fatigue. Case number two will be counting revs at torque, the histogram I just showed a minute ago using this concept of gear tooth loading or resampling into the revolutions domain. You'll see what that means in a minute. Third case is extending case number two to looking at different gears. How can we use information we know about torque spread or torque demand through the transmission, what gear we're in, to track fatigue damage in different gears individually? And lastly, we'll look at how we can calculate gear damage, not just in the cyclic domain, but also in the time domain for cycling components. So with that in mind, we'll happily leave PowerPoint behind and go off and work in a far more interesting environment, which is, which is Glyphworks. And that's what I brought up just here. So here we've got ENCODE Glyphworks. Some of you may have used this before. If you've not, let me explain a few thematic elements in it. Over here, these are what we call glyphs. This is called the glyph palette over on the right side. This is all the different engineering functions or icons or to be techie, we call these glyphs that we have available inside Glyphworks to do different calculations. We've got a wide variety of calculations we'll be using today in a hugely extendable set if we look at the entirety of Glyphworks. We don't have time to do that today, but we've got signal processing tools, fatigue, vibration, statistical analysis, noise and vibes tools, and so on. Again, we're looking at fatigue today, so we're going to focus on that. Over on the left side here, this is what we call the available data window. This is measured test data using various data acquisition devices out there. We support uh, 40 or I think even 50 different time series file formats now. So uh, any one of your data acquisition devices, files will show up on this list. What I'm going to do is drag in some time series data into this area in the middle we call the workspace. This is where glyphs or functions in data, squiggly lines, meet together and our analysis begins. This first box here is called a time series input glyph. 
and it's got five channels of string gauge data in it. So in our use case here, our first use case we said was going to be looking at the fatigue and durability of a transfer case housing. So it's mounted to the uh, maybe a powertrain subframe or a frame of some sort, and under torque conditions it sees various strains, also due to road roughness, bumps, driver inputs, and such. So maybe we've got five separate strain gauges like you see here, uh, put out through uh, five different hot spots uh, around the housing. Now, the housing itself doesn't rotate. We have all the stress and strain information that we need here to understand fatigue. So in that respect, then, we don't need to think about cycles per rev. We just need to go off and do a fatigue calculation. So I'm going to use a fatigue calculation glyph here called the strain life glyph. Do a strain life fatigue calculation. And we're going to look at answers coming from this in a couple of different ways. You'll see why we look at it this way in just a minute. Let me just connect some glyphs in to get answers. And then we're going to use another display here to look at the fatigue results. If you've seen GlyphWorks before, you might recognize some of these glyphs. This glyph I hear called fatigue results. This is actually a configured metadata display. So I've got raw data, some calculation functions, or we could say in our case a fatigue analysis to be done, and then some ways of capturing answers. Now I need to answer some questions on our fatigue calculation. Most notably, I need to tell this fatigue calculation what this differential housing is made out of. So I'm going to pick this material. This is an aluminum alloy. Let's say this is a low pressure cast, uh, aluminum, maybe a 356 aluminum or something. Picked it off the list. That associates a fatigue curve, one of these SN curves or a strain life curve that we talked about earlier, to this design or to this fatigue analysis. There are all sorts of other questions I could answer in here about fatigue, but I'm not going to just to keep things simple. So to keep things moving, let's say OK here. Now we can run this process like this. So the strain gauge data is, is processed. It's read in to our calculation. And each separate strain gauge here is have has had a rainfall cycle count, uh, damage per cycle from the fatigue curve. Miner's rule says damage adds up over time through all those cycles. And we end up with looking at answers like this. Here in the middle of the screen, we have this display that says we analyzed five channels. On each one, Apparently, the cycle counting algorithm counted on the order of uh, 2.1 times 10 to the 4, so about 21,000 cycles, so 20-ish thousand cycles. Miners' damage sum for that is reported in this display as well. If damage is a small number, we hope. If it's less than one, it means we can keep on working, keep on driving, keep on operating until failure. And this is predicting a fatigue life of about 2,000 repeats of the measured input data at this area called the upper corner strain. That's fatigue life in repeats of the time series data. You can think about this as maybe a lap on the proving ground. So fatigue life is estimated to be about 2,300 laps. We also have life in hours because sometimes your customer's usage characteristics are dictated in hours. Construction equipment and tractors and ag equipment typically is not specified in miles of driving, but rather in hours of usage. So you can see here in our, in our fatigue analysis of the housing, we should be most concerned about this upper corner strain. This middle gusset also has a relatively short fatigue life. It might be uh, just a bit too short for our, our liking, depends on what our customer's design target is. But anyway, this is the way we do our classic rain flow based or non-rotating fatigue calculation. So speaking of cycles, let's look at those up here. This is the rain flow cycle count at the bottom. Remember we said that the cycle counting algorithm counted about 20 some odd thousand fatigue cycles? Well, this is their distribution. This is how many cycles on this axis versus how big were they, the cyclic range, and also the cyclic mean. So this means, is it cycling in tension or compression? So this is the distribution of cycles. Lots of small cycles. We hope very few small cycles. Up on the top here, this is what we call the damage histogram. This shows how much fatigue damage is each of those cycles causing. We can see that all the small cycles don't add up to anything. They don't cause any fatigue damage because they're under this material endurance limit. It's the bigger cycles that don't happen very often that are truly driving the fatigue damage total 
that we see in this display, which therefore drives life in repeats or life in hours. So this is the classic non-rotating non fatigue sense, useful for powertrain things that don't have a per rev cyclic distribution to them. Now, use case number two we wanted to look at was how we do this now with rotating parts. So think about if you're a gear tooth, okay? So a gear, your one gear tooth, that gear tooth will mesh and unmesh on every revolution. And what that means then is there's a stress cycle for every revolution, right? The torque applied to the gear tooth causes a stress. The, the torque being removed or unmeshing causes the stress to go away. So we have a, a zero to tension cycle from every revolution, even if the torque is constant. So even under constant torque and under constant speed conditions, gear teeth will feel a once per revolution stress cycle from the engagement. So we need to look at that differently. This is the rotational fatigue sense. Now I've just gone over and changed workspaces in Glyphworks. We have tabs at the bottom here where we can have multiple analysis, things going on at a time. You can see we have several here. Um, the first one, I built this process up from scratch to show how easy it is to connect glyphs and configure properties and run. The rest of these workspaces I actually created earlier today. And that the reason why I did that is now I can focus on using slightly more complicated processes. I don't have to waste your time building these. This, there's a, an analog to your life in this, and that is that if you're an ENCODE user, you can reuse processes very easily. Every time you analyze new data, you can start with a, an existing process like I'm doing here instead of building from scratch. So I'm going to grab some gear torque speed data. So this is, this is gear data here. Let's just take a look at this in the time domain. This is the uh, uh, differential unit. So this is the input torque. So this might be ring gear torque or, or pinning gear torque, whichever. And uh, the speed at which it's rotating at the bottom. And these are important because we want to be able to predict the durability of this component. Now, if you really wanted to, we could have used strain gauges to understand gear durability, but there are a couple of significant challenges. Number one is how do we get the strain gauge in inside the gearbox, right down at the root of the gear tooth? And number two, how do we configure it to get those signals out? On a rotating shaft, we can run into some serious data acquisition challenges. So we're going to use torque here as a global input and we're going to use a torque life curve as this component's fatigue performance metric. So torque and speed, these two things, torque will tell me how big the cycles are, and speed will tell me, tell me how many of these cycles happen. So let's take a look at how this process runs like this, and let's see what we get. All right, so what's happened here is what's critically important is we have to recognize we started with data in the time domain. Now, we're very accustomed to thinking about, mathematically, time as being the independent variable in our lives. And it is in this measured data. But in a gear tooth, that doesn't matter. The fatigue and durability characteristics of a gear tooth or a bearing will be dominated, will be governed by rotations. So really, we need to figure out a way to get out of time domain space into revolutions domain. And that is done using this glyph right here. This is called position-based resampling. And I've set it up to do, if you look in the properties here, I've set it up to do what's called gear tooth load resampling. That means every revolution of the shaft will sample a new data point. So instead of sampling at, say, maybe 500 hertz in the time domain, we're working out of that and using revolutions as the trigger as if we had collected data at one revolution per sample. So now this is torque again. But the x-axis is in revolutions, not time, from zero revolutions all the way to the total number of revolutions that were seen in the time domain. As a matter of fact, you could calculate how many revolutions if you went back and looked at the average of the time, excuse me, average of the speed multiplied by time would give us total number of revolutions. That would give us this 26,000 revolutions. Now, if you look very carefully in here, you'll see that this torque channel goes from peak to zero peak to zero, because that's what a gear tooth feels. It feels a peak torque on engagement, and then torque goes back to zero when it unmeshes. So you could say this is like a virtual torque channel we've created at the root of the gear tooth. And this is great now, because even if the torque is, is constant in the time domain, 
the per revolution torque you can see is varying from zero to that torque value. So this is really useful for us in a fatigue sense. The other calculations I have going on here, this one here is what we call a joint distribution. It says, make up one of these torque rev histograms. Now we, we looked at these in PowerPoint a minute ago. This is it for real now. This tells us that combinations of speed and combinations of torque we see cycles occurring at. So at different torque levels and different speed levels, we have different numbers of revolutions. This is called point count, but it's counting points in the revolutions domain, so it's actually a revolutions count. So this plot here tells me what speeds and correspondingly what torques did these cycles happen at. So this is again answering the main question in fatigue, which is how many cycles of what size? Using this for fatigue, then, is the next question. This is answering the question of how many cycles occurred, how big were they, and the next thing we need to think about then is how do we pull this together into a fatigue calculation. There are a couple ways we can go about doing this. First off, we can take this time series data, or excuse me, this histogram data. Some people say, that data right there is so nice, I need to use it in my homegrown Excel spreadsheet to calculate gear damage. If that's your thing, then we just add a glyph on here. We call this glyph the data values display. Any data you see inside GlyphWorks, we can export to third-party applications. Here, this data values display glyph. This is the same data we're just looking at graphically, but here it, out, here it is now in a table form, where the number of revolutions or cycles is seen in the boxes, and then the torque and the speed is seen in corresponding directions here, vertical and uh, horizontal. That is... I'm showing how to do that because some, some companies that have been doing this kind of gear fatigue have their own fatigue model built that's not just based on torque and cycles, but maybe torque cycles and temperature, or torque cycles and speed. So if that's your thing, this is the way to do that. The rest of this calculation here, I'm actually going to use ENCODE's stress life glyph to do the fatigue calculation instead. So what I've done is I've used the glyph here to collapse this torque, speed, revs histogram down to a 2D view, which is simply number of revs at torque. So these are the torque magnitudes and number of cycles that we're seeing. So we've gone from 3D with speed in it down to 2D without speed, which means then if I have a torque life curve, this is how many cycles at torque were there? A torque life curve that we talked about earlier will tell us then how much damage is caused per cycle for all these different cycles. So just like I used a fatigue glyph before to calculate fatigue in a non-rotating sense, now I've just done all my rotating cycle counting and I plug those results into this fatigue glyph. And I've got a fatigue curve I've associated in here and so on. And in the end, this allows me to say, of the 26,000 cycles that were counted, the total damage is this number right here based on my torque life curve I've used, or it gives me a life in repeats of the original time series data, or it could be calibrated into hours, as we see down here. So in this way now, we're doing a little different cycle counting because we have a per rev consider consideration in cycles, but we're still using a fatigue glyph at the end to calculate damage from those cycles. So that's use case number two, calculating rotational cycles and using them for fatigue. The third use case I want to look, look at is now extend what I'm seeing here now to look at different gears. So what if different gear sets were being damaged at different times because different gears are engaged or disengaged depending on what the transmission is actually providing torque flow through. So that leads to this process here I created called revs at torque and gear. It's a very similar process to what we looked at before, except now I've got one new piece of data. And that is, in my input here, I've got a piece of data. In addition to torque and speed, now I've got a gear position channel. And this is what I've read off the CAN bus. The uh, engine controller or transmission control module has reported back to me what gear it's in currently. And this is just a digital channel. It steps from 1 to 6, depending on what gear I'm in at any given time. Now, the nice thing about this is that with this record at the bottom of what gear I'm in, I can actually separate out what cycles occurred in first gear, 
in second gear and third gear, fourth gear, and so on. So I can start to look at damage to the first gear clutch or damage to the first gear, the, the, the uh, uh, pinion gear that's engaged in first and second, but not in higher speeds. So it just comes down to using some signal processing glyphs in Glyphworks to do this. In my case here, I've got this glyph called the time series calculator acting as a trigger. And I've got it set up to look for, show me when gear position, channel number three, is numerically equal to one. In other words, when am I engaged in gear one? This acts as a trigger, or what we call in Glyphworks terminology, a feature list. Show me interesting features in the time series data. I can see that in the time domain here, in this plot, anytime the data is highlighted, I'm in first gear. So this trigger, the time series calculator, has found for me all the time segments when I'm in first gear. And you can see that down at the bottom plot here. The beauty of this trigger concept is now the graphical editor glyph, which I'm looking at now, can delete all the times that are unhighlighted, or conversely, keep all the times that are highlighted. So the data, the time series data that comes out of this glyph here, this is edited time series data, that's first gear only. And we can see that here. This is first gear only. The time is much shorter. The torque and, and speed occur, are uh, corresponding only to when I'm in first gear, which means then if I plug in these glyphs that I used for calculating before, as I've got here, now I'm doing the same calculations as before, but only for first gear. So here is now the torque revs distribution only for gear one. And likewise, what I've done in this process here is I've taken all of these glyphs and done a copy and paste pasted them down here, and then I changed the logic of my trigger here to say I actually want to look and see when am I in gear number two. Same type of calculation, but it's going to trigger on or find different time segments, as we can see in here, which means then that my torque revs distribution is different. Again, this is the second gear torque revs distribution, which means then if I do fatigue calculations on these, I can calculate damage in gear one, gear two, look down here further, here's gear number three, and this keeps going through a number of different speeds. In my case, this is a six-speed gearbox. So it's easy for me to set up six different, you could say, parallel sections or necks of this process, all analyzing data in a similar way, but with a different gear being broken out. So that was our third use case, revs at torque and damage in gear. Now the fourth one I want to look at is another way to calculate fatigue damage. And again, this is rotating fatigue damage. This time, rather than making a torque revs histogram, I'm going to do all the fatigue damage calculations in the time domain. And you may wonder, hang on a second, how is it we can do this in the time domain? You said that the important thing is that we need to understand speed and torque to understand revolutions so we can calculate damage. We can do all that in the time domain. What I've got here same input data as before, torque and speed. Now, if you think back to how cycles and torque and, or stress and damage are related, let's just go back to PowerPoint for a minute here. We had a slide here that showed the SN curve or the torque life curve. It said that the stress amplitude and the number of cycles to failure, that's this line here, is represented by a power law with an intercept and an exponent, an intercept and an exponent. In other words, number of cycles to failure is related by a power law to the stress amplitude. Or since number of cycles to failure and damage are reciprocals, that means that damage is proportional to stress raised to a power. If you go through the math, you'll find out actually that damage per cycle is found by taking the size of the cycle divided by the fatigue curves intercept, and then raise that to a power. So I can code that up inside a glyph. Let me just show you what that looks like. We use the stress life glyph and some of its calculations, cycle counting, rotating cycle counting, and so on. We can do this in the time domain as well. In my time series calculator glyph, let's just run this and see some answers here. In the time series calculator glyph, I've got it set up to do that fatigue damage accumulation. So it says gear damage, 
as a function of time is equal to channel one, the torque, divided by the number 10,000. Well, that's my torque life curves intercept. So remember we said that damage is proportional to stress or torque divided by the intercept raised to a power. Well, that right here is what I'm coding up. So damage per cycle is cycle size divided by intercept raised to a power. Now, where'd the power four come from? If you look in design handbooks, you'll see for rotating fatigue, like gear tooth bending fatigue, they say that fatigue on the, on the gear tooth is related to stress or torque raised to the third power or fourth power or 10 thirds power for bearing life. If you're used to seeing how is bearing life related to the, the load that's placed on the bearing. I could replace that with a fourth power, 10 thirds power, fifth power, whatever the slope of my torque life curve is. And then we take that, that's damage per cycle. And then channel two is the speed. So again, speed over time gives us cycles. So damage per cycle times speed gives us instantaneous damage, which then if we integrate gives us accumulated damage. So what we see here in this plot is instantaneous gear damage in red, and then it's accumulation or integration of gear damage going this way. The damage increases, increases, increases until at the end of the run, here's total damage. This is Miner's rule being done in the time domain instead of the cycles domain. And it'll give you the same answer as doing the torque at revs concept, just another way to get there. Regardless of fatigue analysis method, one of the nice things about Glyphworks is that I can calculate fatigue damage. And then even, even more flexibly, if I have lots and lots of data from the proving ground, maybe I, I've got three data files here, you might return from the proving ground with 30 or 40 or 10 gigabytes, 50 gigabytes worth of data. I can take all those data files, drag and drop them into this input glyph, run the process, and it'll just spend its it work its way through these data files, spend some time, it'll calculate for each data file separately, here's total gear damage. So I can see which of these events that I've processed on is most severe. And maybe these events represent some sort of, uh, some sort of a duty cycle where we have uh, these three different events represent different use cases in the, uh, in the customer's hands, high speed driving, low speed driving, and clutch stall. And maybe we have we want to calculate damage for each event separately and then add them together as a duty cycle or a, what you might call a, a schedule or composite damage sum. All of the answers we need here are, are, are given in this process. And likewise, we could also use similar types of processing we saw here per gear. And we also saw here for all gears, but looking at total damage using the traditional stress life method. So a couple different ways to get either using the traditional rain flow of cycle counting for non-rotating parts and calculating damage, or these other calculations we've looked at today, which are for counting cycles in the REVS domain, which is, again, as I say, critically important for rotating machinery. So, just as a quick review, what did we do here? We talked about using REVS, torque, and speed to understand durability. We looked at a couple of use cases inside Glyphworks the classic or rain flow based non-rotating cycle counting algorithm, followed by three cases that took torque at revs into account, looking at the per rev cycle counting concept. So with that in mind, I want to uh, give you